Hi everybody, my name is Dr. Joseph Hammer. I'm an Associate Professor of Counseling Psychology here at the University of Kentucky. And this video is all about showing you an example of how some professors may review an application for a doctoral program in counseling psychology. So, you know, if you have seen people submit applications or you yourself have submitted applications that a bunch of stuff is typically requested when you apply to a doctoral program in counseling psych or clinical psych, as with master's programs and those as well. Uh, a personal statement, uh, transcripts from prior institutions, a writing sample perhaps, letters of recommendation, uh, boilerplate information about GPA and stuff. You know, you, you input a bunch of information into the application online, you upload documents, have documents sent in, and then you don't really know what it looks like on the professor's end when they download your entire application. So I wanted to show you and walk you through an example of that. Uh, one of my current doctoral students has graciously agreed to allow me to use their uh, old application uh, to our program. Uh, and so I've de-identified her information uh, for the most part, uh, the obvious identifiers, um, and I'm really excited to show you this. Uh, let's switch over. So now we're looking at the application. So I should emphasize that, you know, every school is different and every program is different in terms of information requested and how it may look when, when they download it on the back end. But UK uses uh, the, the Hobbs Apply Yourself system, which they uh, allow, which they, a, a number of universities basically use this system. And so it's possible that a bunch of the institutions you may apply to in the future uh, could create applications that may look something like this. But just remember that it will vary institution to institution. This is just one good example. Uh, so this is the, the title page that I first see when I select a given applicant and download a PDF of their entire application from the system. Um, Let's see what program they're applying to, what degree. I've stripped out their name and email and date of birth. Uh, demographics listed here. Uh, more demographics here for domestic applicants. Uh, and then what their prior institutions and what degrees they got and what major they got uh, and GPA. And uh, I will say uh, in this context that uh, I will talk not only about what do I think a lot of professors look at as they look through an application like this, but also me personally, what do I pay more attention to or less attention to? And there's, you know, every professor is different in how they look through applications, but I wanted to give you some, uh, you know, anecdotal advice or suggestions about how at least some professors can look over a given application and how they make meaning of it. So. Um, I just need to provide that caveat up front. So, uh, you know, people will take note of, uh, you know, have you done a bachelor's or master's degree? What was your GPA? And look for a level of GPA that they find acceptable. You know, have you have your prior majors and degrees, are they relevant to the degree you're now seeking? Or the, and the farther away they are from psychology, uh, the more hesitant they may be about having you come into the grad program in psych. It just depends on whether they believe you have the prerequisite background that, that you need. I know speaking for counseling psych, a lot of times people who have uh, degrees in like sociology or gender and women's studies or social work or uh, related social science professions, uh, a lot of times, especially if they've taken some uh, psych uh, gen ed courses, some basic psych courses, that sometimes it's not necessarily uh, uh, a really bad thing if they don't have a psych degree. But every, every, everybody varies, and I have some other videos that provide um, feedback on this about, you know, do I need to, can I apply if I don't have a bachelor's in psych? But uh, generally, most people applying to counseling and clinical psych doc programs have a psych bachelor's. Uh, and for those folks, especially in counseling psych, a lot of people tend to do two or three year master's degrees. And so it's common for uh, us when we're reviewing doctoral applications to see master's degrees in counseling psych or clinical psych or counseling 
or social work or marriage and family therapy, you know, these related mental health professions, those master's degree programs will oftentimes be seen as pertinent uh, to wanting to go on to uh, doctoral level work in counseling psych. But we'll, we'll also see gender and women's studies and sociology and biostats and uh, public health and stuff like that. So as long as you can make it clear that you're ready to jump into the coursework at the doctoral level in psychology uh, because of prior experiences you've had, you know, that it's it's fine. But this is where we look for that sort of stuff. Uh, here we'll see what sort of uh, self-reported GRE scores there are in terms of the score and then the percentile. This person's was very high. Um, you know, the average applicant is more like um, 160 and 155, and then probably a 4.5, I think, for a lot of counseling psych and clinical psych programs. Uh, and by the way, check out my counseling psych versus clinical psych uh, web, web page for more info on differences for clinical and counseling psych and similarities, including what they tend to expect in terms of uh, test scores across programs. Uh, if you happen, if uh, English is, your, is a second language, uh, TOEFL scores may be reported here because faculty can take that into account, especially in counseling psych. We want to make sure that you have enough verbal fluency that you'll do fine with, you know, learning the core counseling skills and being able to see clients and stuff like that. Um, and so uh, those are some of the numbers there. If you provided, if you had, uh, you know, the, the GRE uh, organization send in official test scores, those would show up here as well. A lot of institutions, it's just fine to self-report GRE scores. And then if you get accepted, you may have to provide official records later. Same with uh, transcripts, although a lot of programs are doing away with the GRE entirely or making it optional, which I personally think is a good thing because it's culturally biased. Contact information for the person, uh, demographic background for them in terms of race, ethnicity, and educational background. I've uh, blocked out some stuff. The, uh, tra the transcript comes next, and so uh, you can see a list of courses. Uh, for me, I don't tend to, I tend to skim to look for instances of lower grades, just real quick skim, and, and what courses those were, because I understand that a lot of people uh, can uh, get lower grades and stuff that is not related to psych and that can pull down their GPA often. Uh, I'm more concerned if I see lower grades in psych related courses, especially in the latter half of uh, your bachelor's training, if you're applying out of bachelor's or, or especially if you're in a master's program and uh, your master's GPA is lower than like a 3.8 or a 3.9. Usually in most master's programs and psychology, you know, people, grad students just tend to get A's across the board and have, you know, 3.9, 3, 4.0 GPAs. Um, and so, you know, we'll, we'll want to make sure that you're taking those classes seriously. But I mean, it's, it's literally, it's like a, it's a quick skim, just a quick skim, but I don't sit and read the transcripts. Um, because if their if their GPA is is low and I want to know what's driving that, I may take a closer peek. But but otherwise, a lot of people will not spend a lot of time carefully reviewing the transcript. Uh, so that's just something to know. Uh, and then for this is the portion where we look at their CV, and so take note of uh, you know, bachelor's in psychs. Uh, glance at the minor seeing when uh, the expected date is or graduated date is and if there's a big gap between when you graduated from your last degree and uh, th the current date, the, the date you're applying, um, you know, we're, we'll, we may hope that in your personal statement you'll tell a story about uh, that and we'll want to see, importantly, that you've been doing something productive between graduation day and the time you're applying. Uh, right. So like taking gap years and taking time off on whatever is good and fine. Uh, and ideally, you're using that that time well. And so I, I take a peek at when uh, when they earn their various degrees and will want to know how that fits into the story of their seeking uh, doctoral study. Uh, usually everybody has, at least if you're applying to 
uh, PhD programs, you know, scientist practitioner or clinical scientist model programs in counseling psych or clinical psych, we're going to want to see research experience. And so I'm just looking here to see, and I've, you know, I've redacted some information. I'm looking here to see if uh, they have been done some stuff, right? Like if they want to come to a PhD program, they're going to be doing plenty of research. And so we want to make sure that they are interested and like research and that they have a history of being involved in research. So we want to see on their CV, is there evidence of research experience? And, you know, of course, check out like uh, my graduate school advice webpage on drjosephhammer.com uh, where I go into more detail and a variety of resources on, you know, what should we see in terms of prior research experience and stuff like that. I'm, I won't get into the weeds on that. I'm, this is mostly to show you. So I'll take a look at this and see like, okay, generally what did they do? do? Okay, it was about this in this population. They were undergrad, good amount of time, name the lab. Uh, what are some of the things they're doing? And I'll take a peek to see the sort of stuff they were doing in the lab and see if this these are some of the if they feel like substantive things and see if any of this lines up with the sort of experiences I might hope they would have uh, as a as a uh, prior student at the prior institution before coming here. So just make sure this is a legit substantive experience. A similar thing with this, I might take note of whether it's involved in uh, if it's connected to funded research, because that can be good for people to have exposure to doing funded research, but it's not a huge deal. You can see that uh, when I, you know, I have some previous markup on, in this PDF of things that I marked when I was going through it. Um, so taking note of uh, some authorship experience here. So this person was involved in a few research labs uh, and has a few, you know, a few last authorships. And these are both in development, you know, uh, manuscripts that are in development carry the least weight because things can fizzle out before it progresses. And so we give some weight to manuscript and in development. But if a manuscript has been submitted, that carries greater weight. If it's un successfully under review, that's even greater weight. Uh, if it's under uh uh, if it's been returned on revise and resubmit, even greater weight. If it's been revised and resubmitted, even greater uh, weight to that. And then certainly if it's in press, accepted, or published, that's the greatest weight, right? Uh, and so I'll take a note of like, are they connected with, uh, are they co-authors uh, on any sort of pubs? And, you know, professor to professor, it will vary in terms of is this an expectation or not, but it's very common for counseling psych doc programs for people not to be a co-author on a publication like they may be they may be a co-author on some like that are in preparation or in development like this person was um but it's uh, it's uncommon to be a co-author on an accepted paper but it's a nice bonus if, if that is so i'll look to see if they have any publications and then usually people have uh presentations of some kind so if you're applying to a doctoral program it's pretty common to be an author or co-author on some presentations and so for this person I note that okay they're kind of middle towards end author on uh, a few things so that's good that they were involved in some poster or potentially symposia presentations at conferences and I might take notice of what type of conferences okay so this is a national conference national conference uh, local uh, da, 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 post revision association national um, uh, national and specific to a thing. So I'll, I'll just get a sense of like are they are they presenting nationally, internationally, or is it only regionally, or is it only locally? Because uh, the former carries more weight than more local things, but anything is good. So I'll just take a glance to see if they're connected with that. Uh, if they're applying for a counseling psych or clinical psych PhD or PsyD program, they're going to want to have some sort of quasi helping experience. And so I'll look for a clinical experience section to see, okay, what do they do? Okay, 40 hours a week, that's a substantive thing paid. That's pretty substantive. Look to see the amount of time, uh, how long they did this, four months. Uh, they had supervisors. What was it that they were doing? A general sense of the responsibilities, like how, how beefy or substantive uh, were these things, were they doing helping skills related things where they were helping people out? Because you can't do therapy 
uh, before uh, becoming under formal supervision as a graduate student under the license of a mental health professional. You just can't do, do that sort of stuff as an undergrad, but the closest stuff you can do to it is stuff like this. So I'll look for some exposure to things like this because ideally in this mental health-ish sort of setting, there are supervisors who will be able to speak to uh, this, can this candidate's ability to be uh, to develop good rapport with people, like good interpersonal skills, uh, warm, empathetic, those sorts of things that we want to see evidence of when it comes to clinical experiences. And so take a glance at that. Uh, another thing, so this is about four months, substantive resident care intern, it was paid, doing this, okay, engaging in helping skills. So that's two experiences, so that's nice. Uh, honors and awards. Uh, if they have some, that's neat, icing on the cake, but they don't necessarily have to, but they can speak to their quality. And then names of references will be here. Typically, these people are the same people who are writing them letters, and so I would end up looking for that. Um, here's their uh, personal statement, and I'll spend a little bit more time on this. Uh, and in fact, I, I think there's a, a good amount of professors who... They jump right away to the personal statement to get a sense of this person. Uh, so they, they want to see what sort of flavor they get from the personal statement. And, from, and after reading the personal statement, if they find themselves initially excited about the applicant, then they will look at other aspects of the application. Then they'll look at the stuff I showed you above and some of the stuff you haven't yet seen below. Um, uh, and if they were not like uh, inspired by what the person said in the personal statement, they will they will put it off to the side and come back to it if they need to. Because you know when we get because a given professor typically has like five to forty people who apply to work with them in a given year, um, depending on the number of faculty in your program and a bunch of other stuff. But especially when you have more than like five or ten people apply to work with you uh it's you have to be efficient as a professor with how you review applications you cannot carefully read through every single application you tend to spot check certain pieces like i've described so far like i'm looking for key things um I should mention too that one of the things I look for in people's applications is I look for evidence that they've been involved in some sort of social justice or community service or volunteering work, um, especially if they haven't been uh, getting clinical experience. I look for that sort of stuff because it suggests, because especially in counseling psych, we're looking for people who demonstrate evidence of critical consciousness development people who want to address systems of oppression in the work that they do who want to be part of the solution to reduce inequities and so looking for evidence of a time spent and labor spent in addressing inequity uh, is something that i look for evidence for in uh, applications in the different port in the cv uh, and in the personal statement. Uh, so I should mention that too. Not only we're we looking at like research experiences and quality and clinical experiences and quality, but uh, you know, uh, proof that one is serious about social justice. Uh, so we're looking for that. Um, oh yeah, so back to what I was saying that we, you know, we're reading through a lot of applications. So we're spot checking certain things in the personal statement is probably the most carefully read portion of the entire application for most professors. So you definitely, I recommend, want to put in the most care and consideration into the personal statement. And you want to make sure that those parts that should be tailored to that specific program should be tailored really well. And if it's an apprentice model where you're working to work with a you're applying to work with a specific professor in their research lab for the duration of your doctoral studies, you really want to sell the fit between you and that research lab. You know, we're really looking for that if it's a, an apprentice model program, which a lot of programs, but not all programs are for PhDs. Whereas with SciDs, it tends to be more of a cohort model rather than uh, your work, you're applying to work with a specific professor for SciDs. Usually it's more of you're applying because of program match. 
But uh, I, you'll want to check out on my website my uh, personal statements advice. I did. Uh, there was an analysis done by one of my um, collaborators in my research lab who looked at a bunch of personal statement instructions across various counseling psych programs that made those available and we analyzed what sort of information was requested typically by programs in terms of what to talk about in your personal statement and uh, i give advice on all the different things you might include in a personal statement and why you should and when you should and when you should not so check out that resource as well perhaps i'll uh, i'll provide a link to it in the video description um so so what's next so yeah, uh, so with this personal statement, I'm looking for one uh, reasonable command of of the English language because you know doing doing a doc program, you're going to do a lot of APA style writing. If you have a lot of trouble with you know being able to write decent uh, grammatically and syntax wise, it will it's hard to do to write doctoral level papers and especially to publish. So we're looking for evidence that the person can write decently. Because as advisors, we want to help mentor people around how to write in advanced scientific APA style ways, but we don't want to have to mentor people around uh, like basic rules of uh, like English grammar and syntax. Um, and of course, you know, there are, there's a lot of flexibility and, and nuance with that when it comes to folks um, who speak English as a second or third language, you know, international students. Um, where there's adjustments around expectations that need to be made and things that can be put in place. But, but in general, you know, like uh, people who can, who have decent uh, ability to write uh, is something that's attractive um, because it can be, we know that it would be a lot more labor for us as faculty members if uh, we're going to have to do a lot of grammatical correcting of the stuff you write if we're co-authoring something with you. So. That's something to keep in mind. So we're looking for, you know, can you write decent generally? And then we're looking for, of course, uh, the substance of the personal statement. Do we, do we feel moved by what you're saying? Can we picture you? Do we get a rich feel for who you are? Do we feel interested in you, excited about meeting you? Do you feel like a person? You know, do you spring off the page in a lively fashion? Um, do you present as a uh, professional um, but also personable. Um, do you demonstrate interpersonal skills in how you talk about yourself? Do you demonstrate self-awareness in how uh, you talk about your experiences and your goals and what you want from the program? Do you demonstrate that you've done your homework, that you've read up on our website about what our program has to offer and maybe glanced and skimmed our handbook? And do you have a sense of what makes our program unique? our department or university unique compared to other similar programs across the country because we want us we don't want to feel like we're a backup school for you right we want to hear that you've that you are saying things and expressing excitement in this piece and that piece that makes clear you read up on us uh, and that goes for your seeing a good fit between your training goals and our program but also seeing a good fit between you and the research professor or potentially professors who you might like to work with uh, in their research lead uh, lab on their research team if it's you know an apprentice model program. Uh, so those are some of the, the things that uh, we're kind of thinking about up front. Uh, and I think I mentioned self-awareness a little bit. And so not, not only like some emotional awareness and how you're writing, but also some cultural awareness, some critical consciousness, some um, openness to learning and expanding your worldview when it comes to diversity, equity, and inclusion, especially in counseling psych. That's something that, uh, by and large, many professors really, really value. They want to they want to see people who have uh, a base, at least a basic understanding of systems of power and these concepts of privilege and oppression and how that, uh, like we want to hear you speak about how your awareness of these things and what it means for your life so far and what it means for the type of research and, and clinical training you may want to do in the future and what, how you want to give back to your communities and how you want to address uh, systemic oppression that you see uh, you know, we want to hear you engaging with that and seeing yourself as a cultural being who fits into these interlocking systems of oppression. And I know for a lot of us, that's really, it sounds 
may be really intimidating for some folks, but it, it's definitely, you know, you don't have to be an expert, but you have to at least demonstrate a really some some basic foundation, but also a real hunger, interest, and openness in learning more about this and expanding your worldview and awareness around these pieces. That that I think that openness to growth is absolutely essential, no matter what. So uh, let's let's dive in. What I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, kind of read through this, and I'm going to offer. Uh, some off-the-cuff reactions to the stuff that I'm reading so that and right this is just this is just me like I don't represent all professors it's just me and some professors may have similar reactions or different reactions to what I do to this right of course um, but uh, this is just an example of how um, you, know, uh, you know a professor may react to, to seeing certain things in a personal statement just so that you can get a better sense for this so let's see uh, learn the difference between identification problems, the thrill of solving abstract problems I came across. So far, you know, I'm noticing good command of English language as a child. Topic. I would do more research. American racial discrimination. So already this person is mentioning, is naming racism and white supremacy as a, as a system that's real. Question of the history of American racial discrimination landed in me. And again, the history of global drug policy. So th these are uh, upfront signs that this person may want to uh, learn and take seriously things around this. And, and mentioning specific things like this uh, communicates a seriousness about it. It, it sounds credible the way it's worded. Uh, however, I spread my father's book, so I had one comment that he was ever to offer discrete solutions to science. Fascinated to military veterans. So I'm seeing like, okay, what are you wanting from graduate school? Because I want to make sure the thing they want from grad school and from our program is something we can provide. Fascinated military veterans and help seeking behavior. Okay, so uh, for those of you who don't know, my research as a professor, as an academic, as a scholar is in help seeking behavior, i.e. what helps or stops people from seeking help. So already this applicant is prominently name dropping in the first paragraph their interest in this uh topic in this research topic the social science topic and so i'm already seeing that oh they're interested in this thing that i'm interested in so she's helping to sell me on the potential fit between her interests and my interests right she's trying to give credibility to the idea that she's truly interested in this and that's something that professors want to see we ideally, if it's an apprentice model for a PhD program, we want to see evidence that this person is excited to do research in the thing that uh, we research, right? And so this is some early evidence of that. Counseling psych with his vocational focus and emphasis on the whole personhood. Okay, so she's name dropping here that she knows something about the history and the background and the priorities of our specialty area of counseling psychology, right? She's done her homework a little bit. This is an accurate representation. Ideal for the global form of treatment I would like to employ in my future research and practice, mentioning both research and practice. So again, if someone wants a PhD rather than a PsyD, uh, they're going to get training in not only research but clinical practice. And so ideally we want to at least hear the possibility that the applicant would like to engage in both research and practice in the future. Otherwise, why, you know, why get a PhD? Because you're going to get training in both research and practice. So and someone doesn't have to promise to be an academic or go into a research heavy career, but ideally we want to hear evidence that they're going to get to make good use of the research side of the skills that they would be learning in a program like ours. So I like to see that research and practice. Rather than focusing on post-traumatic stressor, what I find interesting about this population are the intrinsic abstract factors that drive their choices to seek and obtain treatment. Now she's using some of the same language that I do in my website and the papers that I write. So I see that she kind of, she's speaking some of the language that help seeking researchers talk about, which suggests she's read a little bit about, about help seeking studies, maybe some of my help seeking work. And so this is giving credibility to the idea that she does have a genuine interest in this area. She's using some of the same terms and framing. Multifi is well-rooted in counseling psychology. 
with multiple points of interest in my software, I chose to jump feet first into available research. So she's going to talk about research experiences. So I got into this lab, blah, 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 blah. The device is not how people, blah, 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 blah. So you, you can see here, I'm saying blah, 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 blah. I'm skipping past like this stuff is less interesting to me. It's okay to include, but I kind of already know about this uh, from the CV, from the resume that I read before, right? Like, okay, they're talking about this. It was on the CV. I saw on the CV some of the things they're doing. So I'm looking for novel content. So what is this? Inform my understanding of the important perception that individuals adjust their adversity. So this is what she's saying. She got out of the experience, okay, blah, blah, blah. Armed with interest in perception, the same as I moved to Dr. Wise lab where maternal blah, 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 fulfilled my more clinically oriented goals. Okay, mentioning goals, and that is a brief evidence based parent. It provides a comprehensive response to clinical problems. Parents of children, uh, which attracted me further to fixing aspect of clinical psychology. Um, in addition to the clinical aspect, Fixing aspect. Of so this is actually, I think, a mistake on the applicant's part. I think because I think she was applying to both the clinical psych and counseling psych programs. She probably meant to say so the, for the fixing aspect of counseling psych. Maybe she meant to say clinical psych. But that's this is this is a great illustrative example in that you know as you copy and paste your initial personal statement and then further customize each program. If you're applying to different types of programs, make sure you know. You're updating all the language, make sure the, the school name is correct, make sure the, the type of specialty and the degree is correct, you know, make sure it's consistent because otherwise a professor can be like, oh, okay, this is clearly like a boilerplate template letter. They forgot to fix this thing and it can kind of uh, break the spell, uh, break our, uh, what's that, what's that called? Um, but yeah, break our engagement, our uh, immersion in the letter. Uh, I've also provided into uh, conflation in the study, right? So development value principles, inventory. So I do a little bit of scale development, so it's kind of cool that, that she's mentioning scale development here as well. But again, this is a little bit less interesting generally because it's kind of regurgitating in narrative form what I know from their resume. But, you know, some professors will want to see this talked about um, in, in, in the personal statement. So it doesn't mean that it shouldn't be here. It's just it's it just makes them stand out less, right? It's less about like the unique pieces of her I'm not learning about unique pieces of her when I'm reading this. This is a little less interest. Choose to integrate my work with my personal research interest of mine. Okay, good stuff, good stuff. Personally, generate an expression. Okay, okay. So I am always really interested in what do they say are the stuff that's most interesting to them because then I look at something like this and I'm like, okay, is this a fit for my research lab, right? Would they be, would they be able to study this thing within the context of my research lab? Um, also became interested in the concept of masculinity as opposed to American military. So I did some, another thing I did historically, in addition to help-seeking research, is men and masculine, study of men and masculinity, general norms, stuff like that. Um, and so a further tie-in uh, with my history as a scholar. As a place to American military, and whether that affects help-seeking behaviors, okay, bringing back in the help-seeking again, right? Really selling her fit, her research interests with what I do. And like taking her unique spin, like I don't do American military stuff. That's not a specialty area. I do help seeking stuff in masculinity. And so this is like her little unique twist that she wants to take on it. And in a lot of labs, that's a sweet spot that you want. You want to be able to articulate this. You want to, you want to be able to say how your research interests as an applicant fall within their wheelhouse or fall under their general area. And that you're not just going to do all literally the same stuff that they do, but you're, you have some unique twists, some unique directions or subpopulations or um, additional variables or like you have some inkling of a vision of some stuff you may want to do to kind of personalize this work to your, your interests. And this will vary uh, professor to professor in terms of how much they want to see that, but I, I like to see someone clearly interested in my stuff and that they have a unique twist in mind for how how they'll how they how they'll do it. Uh different generation the military is interested in fighting. Basically comes to your funding. So like to hear that people are, are getting money or getting awards or scholarships or whatever that suggests excellence. So that's nice. Conduct independent research, doing independent projects, first author projects. That's also a sign because grad students have to take the lead on a lot of projects and do stuff. And so it's nice when we see concrete evidence that 
uh, even as undergrad or master students, they're uh, doing independent work or they're doing first author work with the support um, um, of professors or research labs. So that's cool to see. Hope to contribute to the literature and eventually participate. Treatment. Okay. I hope to. So this is future goals. Liter contribute to the literature. So I hope to do research. So that's good. She wants a PhD. Uh, and so she wants to publish in this literature and eventually participate in research, clinical, so doing clinical work and practice and treatment, so practice. So I can see the tie-ins, research and clinical work kind of have some tie-ins to the um, research interests of my lab, which is cool. Bring a lot for the integration of several hours, opportunity to actually contribute, multi-university publications, some name dropping that she has some, uh, she's a contributor to some publications. Now I remember that these are in the works, right? Um, on intersection experiment, development, applying the measure, the kinds of parent, uh, so we're starting to read our senior on your thesis. So yeah, so again, reminding me that she's doing, and I, it wasn't, I don't know. Now I missed the fact when I was looking at the resume above that she was doing like a senior honors thesis. So it's good that she mentioned that here in the personal statement, because that's a nice thing to know when they're doing that independent stuff. Uh, but I missed that. And so it was nice that it was mentioned here. So it's it's good to see this. Um, study of uh, as moderated. And the stuff that people do an independent study on sometimes can hint at what they themselves might want to do research wise, though it really depends because you, you know, whatever lab you're in, you kind of have to do something in their wheelhouse. I just was myself to writing opportunities. I was involved with writing grants, uh, you know, so seeking grant funding and being involved in professional stuff related to seeking grant funding means applying for money to help you do stuff, including research studies. Um, that's a that's a big plus if you have that. My um, production for problem solving has been paramount to my personal permit to learn. Many societal issues are not so simple. People are not puzzles, broken, capable of neat matching, and that's fine. Overlook their intimate values. So she's communicating her values around, like, I see the complexity in people. Hospice, HIV and AIDS, working with a marginalized population, so I'm noting that. And so introducing the kind of this, not reaching as the cause, but rather the inherent quality of life. Okay, so trying to communicate. Her, her, her worldview, her, her maturity of worldview through things that she's learned. Very different than me. So talking about diversity and intergroup differences. Man, so talking about identity and diversity. The different sort of different approaches. So highlighting some kind of basic principles of cultural competence. So trying to communicate some of that cultural competence to me here. Bent towards now. Why many of them felt behind the discussion? Overall, many of them felt they were bent by the system. You tell me, so identifying this problem. Okay, relative. So mentioning, you know, so talking about systems of oppression, mentioning identity, which again in counseling psych, we, we do want to see the person centering this as a part of the discussion. Defrustration with the current social justice system, right? So naming inequities and uh, and tying it to personal goals. I hope to work and work and provide lower costs on housing, regardless of the ability to pay. So connecting what they want to do to how they will help do their part to facilitate justice. Uh, the whole person talking about values here, multicultural, open minded. Yeah. It was apparent that clients were not able to resolve their career cut timeline. I intend to help improve access to clinical resources. Um, right, so this ties into my research conduct research in military culture and develop strategies for improvement, which can tie in and give my clients to live. So I mentioned some clinical and some research stuff, but it's congruent with like what they would learn in the program and what they would learn from me in the research lab. I largely, now if you're going to mention what sort of like theoretical orientation or treatment approach you want to take, you want to make sure you want to see evidence in the description of the program that you're applying to that they're going to give you strong training in that thing. Because as it happens, uh, our doctoral program does not center CBT, cognitive behavioral therapy, 
as like the big thing that we train doc students and we tend to expose them to other forms of therapy and they get they have the chance to integrate multiple forms of therapy including more humanistic approaches and interpersonal approaches and emotion focused approaches so um you know you want to make sure the thing you say you want to be about or get you'll be able to get from the program to that end research interest in dovetail with my own so here you know she's been hinting at plenty in advance which is great and here she's really being direct about here's how dr hammer the person i'm applying to how his program of research matches with my interests his previous research with veterans and masculinity so she's showing me she knows about some of my stuff which is good right show the professor that you know some of what they've done that you've read some of it his previous research provides a jumping off point into analysis of military so she's saying like i've seen his stuff and i can see how i can extend it with this unique twist this military masculinity right makes sense it's usually the it's a good framing i already uh, due to my involvement so I, and would like to spend that uh, and so this is what i would like to do yeah so we're we'll getting into this further interest develop and using 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 models using models typo try not to have typos um i know it's super hard it's easy for a typo to sneak in and like one or two typos in a personal statement you can get by with and usually won't be heavily penalized but definitely if you have like three or more typos uh that's going to suggest at least to some professors a lack of attention to detail um so you want to be really careful to proofread that it's good to have friends or family or whoever do it because sometimes you're staring at the page for so long you don't even see the amusing is a word, so it wasn't caught by spell check, but it's the wrong word, right? It's, it's, it's an error, so catch something like that. Interest development using models that close the treatment gap. Okay, you speak in my language, is near and dear to my personal as well as professional interests, especially in the context of, yep, 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 yep. As skills and reach to an asset, so selling herself appropriately in this web will provide me, so what will this give you? So yeah, goals, it dovetails with your goals. The ability to become a compassionate clinician and capable researcher. So you want to, as a part of your personal statement, say what you want professionally, and it should be clear. And what you're saying that you want ties in with what we can give as a research lab, as me as her mentor, and then also the the doctoral program itself. And the tenant issues, the contextual, and then again, bring in diversity, equity, inclusion pieces there. So that's kind of my, so I would, you know, I went slower through this than the other spots and I went slow because I was verbalizing all of this, but otherwise, I mean, I'm tending to read kind of pretty quickly like this and making note of key things. And I'm noticing what stuff gets me excited and what stuff may be red flags or turnoffs. And, you know, based on how I read this i will either look at the rest of the materials more in depth or not and so the uh, personal statement can really make or break you um so that's that's an example of how i, I kind of went through a personal statement and, and reacted to it so now uh the writing sample uh this is where in addition to the personal statement a lot of programs want to see you know how well do you write especially in apa style because we like to work with people who are generally better writers uh, and so the writing sample can be a chance to do that we want the writing sample generally to at minimum be something that's first author uh, and preferably something that's solo author because if you if your writing sample is something that you co-authored with other people then we don't know well hey is this stuff i'm reading the result of your work and your writing or did you do a like a rough draft that was pretty sloppy and then your professors and your mentors cleaned it up for you and now it reads really well right in that case you know we wouldn't we want to know from the writing sample that this is your writing and reflects your style and ability to write uh because when that's ambiguous about well was is it does it read really well because there are professors who are co-authors on this uh then we won't know we won't have the data that we need from the writing sample and that's a that's a risk right and some people are like co-authors on a publication that can be that can seem really prestigious to include but at least just speaking for myself um you know ask other professors but just speaking for myself the writing sample is not about oh what's the most prestigious thing that i've written that i can show you it's about like what's the best thing that i've solo written or, or at least first author written where i'm responsible for the vast majority of the written content so that we can see how you write you know i want to see your ability to write clearly succinctly well 
um, and to communicate things in a logical fashion. So I will gl I will super glance this. So here's an example. And forth for a period of effect. So already I've gotten a sense just looking at their syntax and style and grammar use and spelling that they're they're a strong writer. So I cut out a bunch of pages, so we're gonna skip right over that. But you know, I, I will read it until I get a sense of like, okay, they're a strong writer, or uh, they're okay, or uh, this is pretty rough. It's kind of it kind of boils down into one of those three categories. And as long as they're like good or okay, the other aspects of their application. Um, can be brought into the mix, but if there is if it's a really rough writing sample that can get me nervous about um, the possibility of, of working with that student. Um, so that is something to consider. Uh, so I've stripped out a bunch of identifying information from the letters of rec, but if you're ever curious, like what does a letter of rec look like on the other end? I think this is one of the more fascinating things for people. Um, so uh, this, you know, programs tend to have a, either two or three required letters. For Kentucky here, we require two, but encourage three. And so this person uploaded three. And so when you enter your professor's info and email address into the application system, uh, at some point, they, the system will send that professor a link and an email to their inbox. And be careful, it can often get caught in spam. So be sure to communicate with your professor to make sure they got all of the letter of rec requests that were coming their way because some always end up in spam from the people I write letters for so they'll get a letter they'll click on it they'll access it and then they'll be they'll see a lot of this boilerplate information and confirm who they are and stuff uh, and then they'll do usually most programs uh, the letter writer is supposed to rate the applicant on stuff like this the rating scales and how many things are rated and the names of them differ, but it tends to be a variety of things like these. These are considered like the transferable skills uh, of, of professional practice and research, right? Uh, like these are qualities we all hope to see in applicants. And so typically the rating scales are like top 1% versus top 5% versus top 10% versus top 25% versus top 50% versus bottom 50% or something like that, right? And ideally, the people who tend to get offers to doctoral programs tend to be in the upper echelons of stuff, right? At least the top 25% on certain abilities. Um, and when we look at stuff like this, I will look to see what the overall percent is. So this is a very, you know, top 2% is like the best or the second best rating, probably the best rating for us. Um, and so I'll see like, okay, I'm just noticing a bunch of really strong top percent ratings. Um, and, and by the way, for those who don't know, the, the question is something along the lines of compared to other students to compare to other bachelor students or other grad students uh, that you've worked with in the past. Uh, how does this applicant fare? Are they in the top 2% of all students that you've worked with or the top 10% of all students that you've worked with or the top 25% of all students that you work with? And so, you know, the more towards the top upper echelon, the stronger the rating. Like someone who, uh, if I've been working with somebody and I tell uh, an institution like, oh, this person is in the top 2% of everybody I've ever worked with, that's a very small elite group like they're the cream of the crop whereas if i say oh this person was in the top 25 percent uh it means that there's a plenty of other people who have that same level of ability and so it's a little less impressive so hopefully that makes sense but so i, I know you know what's the overall average rating and then i look and let's see if i can see an example uh, i'll come back and i look to see patterns of rating so fives tens and i look to see uh if there is a particular area because a lot of times people will use the same rating for most stuff. Like all this is top five or ten percent, and there's an equal sprinkling of fives and ten, so no clear pattern. But let's say this was top five percent, and then the rest of these were top twenty percent. That in that case, that would be clear that like, oh, this thing that got that 
cream of the crop rating must be a special strength of theirs. And I'll make note of that. The flip side is also true. If these were a bunch of top fives and 10%, but then this was top 50%. So there was a place that sticks out like a sore thumb as having a bad rating. Like, oh, maybe they, they're particularly not as strong around this thing. And I would think about whether that means something to me. So for me personally, um, yeah, so twos and fives, similar. So, so for me personally, like if I saw someone had a, a much lower rating on like diligence or persistence or like oral or written communication or interpersonal skills in particular, like if they're rated well, but their interpersonal skills to get a lower rating, that can give me, that can be a red flag to me because I want the people that we accept in the program to have good interpersonal skills. That cannot be a deficit area. Or if they're a poor communicator, that can be a problematic deficit area. Now, of course, there are exceptions for like people speaking English as a second language. Like I'm going to expect international students who uh, have not been speaking English actively as much as I have. Like, of course, the uh for those folks who have less practice that like written communication or particularly oral communication may not be a strong rating so you know professors generally will take into context these ratings and think about their sociodemographic background and adjust accordingly right so i'm not going to penalize people who speak english as a second language for having less good ratings on some of these things because that's expected if i if i was expected to apply to a doc program where everybody would be speaking Spanish, you know, my Spanish is pretty poor. Um, and I, you know, I would not get very good ratings despite being a smart cookie and a, and a good student. So like you, you got to take things in context, right? Good, good professors will do that. Um, so uh, that's just one kind of thing to know. Um, wow. I was just looking, we're like 51 minutes in. This is a long analysis. Hopefully it, it's been fascinating though. Uh, yeah. So, uh, so I will look for those patterns and then sometimes they'll have something like this. How likely would you be to hire and or accept this student? So for us, this rating scale is uh, without reservation, which is the highest rating, or very likely or likely. Those are the three ratings. And so typically most everybody, like 80% of letter of recommendation writers um, are saying without reservation. And so if someone's getting like very likely or especially just likely ratings, that can be a potential red flag. I, you know, that will raise my eyebrows. I'll wonder like, well, why is it because of some thing about your unique circumstance that, you know, while they're an excellent person, they'd be a good fit for me. You have something idiosyncratic going on on your end where they wouldn't be a good fit. So I'll keep in mind who is the person writing the letter? Because if, if, it is a if it's their clinical supervisor at a clinical placement and they know the student is not going to go in a heavy clinical direction you know they may rate this lower because well it wouldn't make sense for that student to be hired in because that's not going to be a good fit likewise if the professor uh, was like a chemistry professor and the student had demonstrate goodness in the things that I care about, but they may or not may be a good fit for chemistry, I wouldn't be surprised if that chemistry professor said. Uh, something lower than without reservation because the student is interested in counseling psych, not chemistry, right? So it's contextual. But especially if someone's in like a clinical or counseling psych program similar to ours in many ways and they get a lower rating here, I'll wonder why, right? So I don't, I won't necessarily know what the true significance of these numbers or this is, but it's just like, it's just pieces of, you're like a sleuth, you're like a a detective trying to piece together pieces of evidence and look for potential red flags and try and make meaning of that, especially in the context of the letter that we're about to read. So you can compare the ratings to the letter and try and discover additional things. So what capacity have you known the applicant? Uh, so it's good to know, like, how have you known them? Because if you, if this person was just like a course instructor, uh, and you showed up and you got an A and you know, made good course contributions during discussions, like that's, eh, that's okay, but it's not terribly compelling. And you should see my other resources on my website, by the way, for uh, what I recommend in terms of who to write letters and how to get, make sure you get strong letters of recommendation and how to avoid lukewarm letters and um, who are credible references and that sort of thing. Ideally, at least a semester, longer is better. And then usually people will say, please use an attached letter instead of summarizing strengths and weaknesses here. 
in the spot. Um, usually they'll just say, hey, see my attached letter, which they wrote out. So here's the first letter. Happy to write this letter in strongest support. So I'll look to see, I'm looking to number one in a letter. Are there any red flags that I'm hearing about? Are, are, they, are they hinting at explicitly or implicitly or subtly red flags about this student? Um, because um, people, professors can sometimes be cautious in what they write. Uh, and so they will, they will say things offhand or they will use coded language or offhand comments to hint to us that they believe this applicant has some serious shortcomings, but they'll say it in a way that's very sly uh, and and neutral because uh, well there can be various reasons for that, but but that's just something to know. Which is why you know lukewarm letters or wishy washy letters are bad. You need strong, uniformly positive letters for these purposes. So I'm happy to write this letter, okay, of strongest support. So that's a that's an indicator. Uh, that's suggesting that they really support. So I look for like how strong is the support, strongest support. I have known American Research Lab. And a lot of people who write letters have a template letter and then they'll adjust things and throw things out and add things in and tweak things depending on that particular student. So that's just something to know. A lot of us have template letters that we start from and will adjust depending on how we know the student and uh, how they've performed, and etc. Has been an exceptional undergraduate. So bold, bold of the word exceptional. So this is already is a very green flag. It's already looking like a strong letter and excels in all areas that will lead her to be a, some superstar. Whoa, okay. So this person is really, really, uh, you know, it makes sense. These top two ratings is really coming out in how they're writing. So this is filling me with confidence. You know, I like to see this, someone reviewing letters that this person is excited and giving fulsome, full-throated support for this person. And, uh, 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 capable, completely and rapidly and effectively good. Directly promoted her. That's nice to hear. Several. I agreed to supervise her. So this sort of stuff, like because they did great, I was willing to invest more in them. Love to see things mentioned like that. Combination of driving force, a combination of her interests in gender and parenting. I'll pay attention to this, uh, especially if multiple letter writers speak to this and they say, oh, she's interested in X, but I do Z. I do this different thing. I'll be like, wait a second. Am I being bamboozled? Is this student just telling me in the personal statement that they're interested in my stuff, but everybody else in the room seems to think that they're really interested in this other thing? I will pay attention to stuff like that. And so that's something that you can't necessarily control with your letter writers, but you may want to, if possible, have a discussion with them up front, let them know who they're applying to work with. And it's good if they're saying things about your interests that are true and will be applicable to everyone that you're applying to work with so that they can say something that won't make you look silly, right? So not a huge deal. Um, interest in gender and parenting. She didn't mention really parenting that much at all when it came to me, but she did emphasize gender. So that part makes sense. Driving force, innovative, ooh, inventive. We are connecting data, so that's good. Progress, you know, I wanna see concrete evidence of progress. Uh, not getting stuck in literature review stage that suggests a seriousness and a professionalism. I've kind of been as you already have one or two author. Ooh, that's okay. That's an endorsement. The handling data, some stuff you know, for them. It's so great, strong. I assigned her to contribute to any fund. Okay, getting involved in grant fund research. That's good. And product and fit would be impressive for a mid career graduate student. Okay, yeah, we love to see that when someone at a applicant level is being compared to someone who's already a grad student. That's exactly what we want to see. We want to bring in applicants who are already uh, looking and functioning and speaking and researching and clinicalizing like current graduate students, right? That fills us with confidence. Asset to any lab that she joins. Nice. As many other accomplishments. So just talking, he's kind of summarizing stuff from uh, the CV, I think. Uh, course performance. Good, good. You're beyond outstanding. That is true. In the next five years, 
Reliable, easy, love that. Love reliability, easy to supervise. That's important responsive feedback, super important. Counseling, clinical psych, well prepared for mail me. We'd like to be prepared. Driven, yeah, we like that initiative and drive. Eager to contribute, that's good. Joy to work with, we like that. We want to have fun with the person. We want to feel good about interacting. Easy to get along with, that's important. Probably humorous. <laughs> Interpersonally, good. Yeah, hand, can handle stress, that's good. I think very highly, uh, strongest possible recommendation. Love to see that. Right, the seat gash, hard, right, 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 right. Yeah, so this letter you know, really fills you with confidence. So that's great. Uh, okay, fives and tens here. Very likely, so one down from without likely. So I'll be like, hmm, I wonder what that's about. Where's an undergraduate in my lab? One and a half years, all around good, solid students. That's good. A little wishy washy, but good. More rigorous. Well, of course, that applies to everybody. The strong support. That's nice. I'm very successful. You know, very dependable, motivated, very active. Maturity, good. Responding to different interests. Very receptive feedback, good. Dedicated, good. Inquisitive, helping others in the lab, good. Paying it forward. I've been numerous, so it's definitely the top 10 out of many. Good quality, that's good. Research that has come and received positive um, That's nice. Okay, some people take the time out to, to congratulate or say nice things about the student. Very serious and great team later. Nice, nice, nice. Interpersonally, pleasure to interact with. Like, good, professional, yeah. Oh, even mentions my customized letter. That's a nice touch. You don't have to, but it's a nice touch. It helps him, yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, that's even nice that she's having or he's willing to name the connection with me. That's usually people aren't willing to customize letters to each program like that, so that's a nice touch. Strongly supported. Yeah, so good, good. So, all right, T twos and fives, very likely. So again, not without reservation, but very likely. But let's see the letter. Student research, two to three years, solid, attached letter. Okay. Letter of recommend writing this who has applied for admission in your address for you. one of the most responsible countries I've ever met, a strong. Enthusiastic, take seriously. Keep up with the discussion, so mature. Never seen to know All the inside of the that's good. Reliable, good. Clinically focused, matured, reliable, motivated. Yep. Star students, strong, right? So this that's how I kind of, pro, you know, I read through it fast, but I'm looking for like, I'm looking for evidence of strong endorsements and, and, and you know, celebrations of strong assets and the absence of red flags. So in this thing I, I read, which is understandable, uh, there are, there were no red flags, right? The, the red flaggiest, yeah. So yeah, there were no, there were really no red flags. So that's good. The absence of red flags of, of strong weaknesses hinted at and plenty of like hints of like strong support and real excitement. So that's the sort of stuff you want in a letter. You want the letters to help your case. You don't want them to muddy the waters or hurt your case. So woo, where are we at? We are at 63 minutes. My goodness gracious. Well, that was beefy. So uh, that is one example of how uh, some counseling psych and clinical psych professors may work through an application and what they may look at more or less. And I hope you heard the core importance of the personal statement and what function the writing sample does and does not serve and what the letters should be doing for you. And uh, you know, the functions that a CV and resume fill and how kind of quickly the glance at that CV and resume is and how, you know, the transcripts only get a, a mere glance a lot of times. So I'm, I cannot promise that um, how I look through an application or the things I think about it or what other people will think. This is just one example again. So let me for the bazillionth time reinforce that this is just my 
opinion. It's my informed opinion, and I do believe a lot of professors share some similarities with me in how they digest an application like this, but um, you know, it's not going to represent everybody. But I hope this gives you a much more concrete sense of how at least some professors, when they're evaluating pot potential doctoral students for their program and specifically to join their research lab in psych, how they may approach thinking about an application. And big thank you to my uh, student who's willing to uh, donate her uh, application for this purpose. Uh, and I hope this was very informative and helpful. And, you know, please check out uh, my resources on uh, drjosephhammer.com if you have not already. Uh, so I've got uh, stuff for prospective doctoral students interested in working with me. If you're a UK uh, student, you can do an RA ship in my lab. Uh, I've got a bunch of advice on graduate school in psychology, how to apply, tips for interviewing, how to build relationships with professors, how to get strong letters of recommendation, um, a bunch of questions about like gap years and uh, context for international students, uh, difference between counseling psych and clinical psych, career interviews with clinical and counseling psychologists and grads, students, panels on counseling psych, Best doctoral programs in counseling psych, a list of counseling psych faculty research interests, which can be useful for people exploring potential professors they may want to apply to work with if they're interested in an apprentice model program, uh, and just a bunch of other a bunch of other stuff. Uh, I have a extensive uh, there's that personal statement of purpose for counseling psych uh, resources that I mentioned where I did this analysis. Uh, with the help of a, with an undergraduate RA in my lab of uh, what stuff uh, is typically asked for in these personal statements and doctoral programs uh, and my advice on each of those things of my uh, YouTube series on how to get into a counseling psych PhD program with lots of different stuff going into much more depth than you heard me uh, get into with this uh, with this application review. Uh, and if you have questions remaining, feel free to ask a question about grad school, and I will uh, get back to you, assuming I can answer it via email or may record a video and then share the results with everybody anonymously if it's something that I think other people are curious about. So, yeah, um, I hope that this has been helpful, and thanks for stopping by. Check out the other videos on my YouTube channel. Check out my website, drjosephhammer.com, for more resources. Uh, and Thanks for being here and good luck.